Secretary of State, Senator Pat Jalen, who is trying to blend into the woodwork, which is difficult to do when you're wearing red and purple. <laughs> and my wonderful uh, colleague from the House leadership, Representative Sarah Peake from Provincetown, and I'm not blending in all places at the bottom. And I'm sure we will be joined by others in the course of the afternoon. Yes, come on in, don't be shy. Uh, because of our extraordinary guest of honor today, uh, President James Madison, the fourth president of our United States, on the occasion of his 266th birthday, to which I think we should all give a resounding huzzah. Huzzah! <laughs> Which I assume is the 18th century thing to do. Um, this is very appropriate, yes. For, for, in honor of a birthday. And uh, I, I actually uh, met President Madison in Davis Square, Somerville, back in October, uh, where he was uh, registering people to vote. And I did not at first recognize him because having been misled by the history books, I thought that President Madison would be a little bit mm, short, shall we say. <laughs> um, but, but what I've come to realize is that President Madison has only grown in stature over time and uh, giving him, him the elevated and, and dignified, uh, always dignified appearance, which we enjoy today. So again, thank you for coming. I want to acknowledge also uh, the Lady Presidentess, uh, Dolly Madison, um, also famous in her own right, although it is not her birthday. She is, she is a welcome guest, and the event would not be quite the same without her. But now I am going to turn the podium over to President Madison, who has prepared some little remarks for us today on this occasion. Welcome. <laughs> very much, Representative Provost, and it is a great honor to be here at the State House of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, one of those colonies which, which was instrumental in the creation of our marvelous country. <clears throat> the essence of government is power, and power's twin sister, whose name is money. All of legislation is about power and money, taking it from one group and giving it to another. I am known as the father of the Constitution, an honor which I have declined on regular occurrence, while I was instrumental in the foundation of this country. I do not think that I was the father. There are many, many other men who are equally involved in the creation of this excellent document. The father of the Bill of Rights, however, that I will say is most accurate. I had, I had originally protested that a federal listing of the rights of man was not really useful or appropriate. That what use is a mere parchment barrier? It will not slow a tyrant at all. However, I was under great pressure and people said that they would not vote for the Constitution unless those rights were expressed. And so I decided that, yes, I would support a Bill of Rights after we ratified the Constitution. And so we did. And I proposed a Bill of Rights. I took 120 suggestions from the various states, whittled them down to 20, of which the states and the Congress selected the 10 which you are most familiar with. There are two which were very important, which did not get passed, which I'd like to point out. There was a prohibition against economic monopolies and a prohibition against a standing army. This, of course, is why we have the Second Amendment, such that men should have the option of carrying their weapon to serve in their militia because we would not have a standing army. How different would our country be if those two amendments had passed? As I'm sure you are all aware, by 1785, the Articles of Confederation had proved ineffective. 
They required all 13 states to approve a federal taxation, something which never happened. Leaving our soldiers without food, without weapons, without pay. This disgusting situation could not endure. The fall of 76, a conference was called in Annapolis to consider rights of navigation and tariffs upon the river, but only five states sent representatives. We were very disappointed, but Colonel Hamilton, Colonel Hamilton took it as a challenge and insisted that no, we should come back a year later and let us have a convention to entirely replace the Articles of Confederation. Congress did not approve. So I spoke quietly with him, suggested if he changed his words slightly and merely said that we would have a convention to fix the deficits of the Articles, that this would be sufficient. Congress approved, and it was merely up to us to get the 13 states to show up. The fact that the fact that the best way to fix the Articles of Confederation was to start anew, I did not think it was necessary to mention those details. <clears throat> ah, but 13 states to send delegates, how would we accomplish this? There's only one possible way to encourage them to do this, and that was to get General Washington to attend because the general was approved. He was admired by every person in the States. I had worked closely with the general at the end of the war, and so I had his ear. He was not enthusiastic about the concept. He did not expect us to be successful, but he did not explicitly refuse to come. And that, of course, is all that I needed. I would speak quietly with the other representatives, explaining to them that the general needed them to appear and send a delegation. And as each state said, well, if the general says that it must happen, I shall certainly send a, a delegation, I finally could return to General Washington and report that 12 of the 13 states, <coughs> Rhode Island being the exception, <coughs> had agreed to send delegations. And so, of course, President uh, General Washington said that he would come. We arrived in Philadelphia two weeks early and wrote an outline known as the Virginia Plan. This is what we started with. Perversely, we lost every single major battle that we fought in the Constitutional Convention. I felt that the state, that the Senate should be apportioned according to population. And of course, it is two per state. I felt that the federal government should have the right of veto over state laws. Instead, we were left with very vague concepts of states' rights. And more than those, I insisted that we eliminate the horrendous state of our country and eliminate slavery. Instead, we had a prohibition about importing Africans after 1800. But my major concern for our country, as I said in Federalist 10, was the existence of factions whether they be political parties or other groupings of people. And of these groupings, the one that I was most concerned about was that of wealth. <clears throat> the most common and durable source of factions has been the various and unequal distribution of property. Those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed distinct interests in society. In 1800, the richest 1% of the country held 6% of all of the wealth. They were 20 times wealthier than the average laborer. With the growth of manufacturing in the North, so strongly supported by Colonel Hamilton, I was fearful that this inequity would expand and that, and when he proposed that we should use federal tax money to support the four I mentioned, I was apoplectic. <clears throat> Hamilton, in so many ways such a brave and noble and brilliant, resourceful man, and yet his admiration of the British system I found appalling. Hamilton suggested that we should have a king, that we should elect a king for life. And worse, he proposed a national private bank with the issuance power of money. 
a private bank that would control our currency. This is the very antithesis of our Republican values. <laughs> Let me quote my dear friend Thomas Jefferson. As I'm sure many of you know, Thomas Jefferson and I were almost unable to part ways. There is a house, there, there, there is a, an apartment in his house reserved for myself and Dolly. We were there so often. But to quote uh, Jefferson, <clears throat> if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that shall grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent that their fathers conquered. Here again is my message to, do, to you. Do not let the money changers and the paper speculators influence your legislators, for they will use every form of abuse, intrigue, deceit, and violent means possible to maintain their control over government. <laughs> One success I did have was the creation of the Electoral College. By ensuring, <laughs> by allowing the people to make a selection, choose one of their own to carry their values and make that decision for them. We have taken power away from the state legislators. We have taken a power away from the politicians and whatever political parties might exist. And then people can select one of their friends, one of their neighbors, someone whom they knew to carry their values and make the best decision to choose a wise and capable executive. I thought we had done a very good job here. In 1794, I was 43, year old, 43 years old and still a bachelor, presumably for life. The yellow fever had passed through Philadelphia the previous year, taking the lives of a tenth of the population. Within three months, one out of every ten citizens in that sprawling metropolis died from the yellow fever. In particular, it left Dolly Payne Todd, a widow, widower, 26, and a mother of one surviving son. I knew of her, I admired her, and I requested my friend Erin Burr to introduce us. Let's see, she wrote this lovely letter at that time. Let me read it for you, <clears throat> from Dolly. Dear friend, thou must come to me. Aaron Burr says that the great little Madison has been asked to be brought to see me this evening. The great little Madison. That is how they referred to me. <laughs> we were married four months later and our lives were ever blessed. In so many ways I am content with the results of our effort. Most particular that we are a single nation. I had nightmares that our confederation would fall into warring factions, as had every other confederation in the history of the world that I studied. So at least the important battle was won. It is only slavery that has haunted me for the rest of my life. Perverse, isn't it, that Washington and Jefferson and myself were such adamant anti-slavery activists, and yet we depended on slavery for our own wealth. I became a strong supporter of the American Colonial Society, which assisted free men moving back to Africa to the country of Liberia. As it was, only about 15,000 people took that opportunity. It seemed that the American Negro had the same frightful image of Africa as his master. Unlike Jefferson, I did not try to free my slaves in my will, because like Jefferson, I was in debt. And had I tried to do so, like Jefferson, my slaves would have been seized to pay my debt and they would have been scattered across the South. Instead, I left that decision to my wife, Dolly. 
She arranged for our white families and friends to take each of our slave families as families so that they would have good and safe owners. It is not what I wanted, but it is infinitely better than what would have been fallen them otherwise. I know that since my demise in 1836, this slavery has happily been eliminated. I know that you have produced amazing machines and marvelous developments at a fraction of the effort that we required in my day. It is only my concern that these marvels be shared among the entire population, that all citizens should profit from the success of their nation, and that none should be left behind. I pray that you are able to say, as we could not in my day, that you have brought the final realization of our promise of 1776, the spirit of 76, that all men, indeed all people, are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. <laughs>